Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. After 18 months of this, you know the drill. Tell me where you're tuning in from. Because it is really the nicest part of this, I think, is seeing where everyone is from. Well, one of the nicest parts. The content is the best part, right? <laughs> Bangkok, oh my goodness. Dallas, Folsom, California, welcome. Costa Mesa, oh, St. Albans, welcome. And last year I probably said my sister-in-law and my nieces used to live there. Berlin, hello. Oh, here we go. Pandemic stranded in Pennsylvania, oh, I'm sorry. London, hello, Berlin. Lovely, we will let a few more of you get logged in. Bedford, Massachusetts, Edmonds, Washington, hello. Fremont, excellent neighborhood representing. Vancouver, BC, oh, with your four-year-old, oh. Make these cookies, Munich, Finney Ridge. All right, we'll let a few more people get logged in here and we will get started. All right. Okay, I think this, another Fremont, excellent. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. I'm Laura Hamilton. I have a cookbook shop here in Seattle, Washington called Book Larder. We uh, have just started to do some cooking classes in person and some uh, author talks in person as well, just a few. But for the time being, we are continuing our Zoom author talks, which makes a talk like today's possible. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Louisa, Vi Louisa Weiss and Molly Weisenberg. They are going to make some fantastic gingerbread pockets from Louise's book, Classic German Baking. And um, they are also going to answer your questions. So please use that little Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to ask questions. I will drop a link to both Molly's and Louise's books in the chat so that you can support the author talk by purchasing them um, from us if you choose to do so. And I know many of you already have the books and so that is great, don't worry about it, it's all good. Um, we're really here just to sort of get in the holiday spirit and um, you know, it's December 2nd and if you follow the uh, American way of doing dates, it's 12 to 21, right? So it's, yeah, anyway, one, two, 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 one. Um, so we're going to, uh, like I said, answer those questions. And so please, like I said, be sure to use that Q&A button if you have them. All right. So now after all that flustering, if you could please join me in welcoming Molly Weisenberg and Louisa Weiss. Hello! Hi! 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 Oh, I'm so glad we're doing this again. Me too. Me too. This is the kickoff of the season for me. Yes. yes. Have you already been making a lot of cookies? Nope. This is the beginning. <laughs> Great. I, I, I always wonder, you know, with all of the, um, with Advent and everything, which I feel like I barely, all I know about Advent is mostly through your book, but um, I wasn't sure if you had been doing a few cookies to get ready or we made we made um, gingerbread houses the other day. That was the sort of the unofficial start because Thanksgiving and, and Advent really like squished up against each other this year. Um, and so that's basically it. Like I haven't really gotten started yet. So I'm excited to kick it off with you. <laughs> and these, so last year we did Bibola. Am I pronouncing yeah. that right? Yes, okay. perfect, perfect. Um, I know everyone wants to hear you pronounce today's cookie, so let's not make them wait. Okay, so we're gonna make we're gonna make an Austrian cookie, and the Austrians have obviously 
Austrians speak German, but they have like funny words for things. It's kind of like English people and Americans, you know, like in English people say boot instead of trunk or whatever. Anyway, and Americans think it's cute. Um, so these are called Lebkuchen Powidel Touchkern. And Powidel is the Austrian term for Pflaumenmus. And um, Pflaumenmus is the jam that the cookies are stuffed with. And it's basically just a, um, a roasted plum jam. There you go, that's pureed and sometimes spiced, sometimes not. And, and um, it's like a staple of the Austrian baking pantry. Um, and uh, and yeah, so that's <laughs> that's where we're making, but it's such a mouthful that even I find it difficult to repeat it over and over. So I feel like we should just go with gingerbread pockets, <laughs> which is easier and somehow also cute. So that's my um, suggestion. I, I had written to you um, when we were planning this event to ask if I could use my own like homemade plum jam, because you have a recipe for Flaumann mousse in the book, but of course it's too late in the season for me to make any. Um, and for anybody who's at home who didn't get a chance to get onto their like online German market and purchase this stuff, can we use other plum jams or what would we need to do in order to be able to use that? So I would say that basically what, what makes Flaumann different from plum jam is that it's um, it's been cooked in the oven, so it's quite thick and sticky. It's not really like a paste, but it's not as loose as a lot of um, homemade plum jam is. So if all you've got is homemade plum jam, I would reduce it a little bit in a pot, in a pan, uh, in a pan, pot. <laughs> I would reduce it a little to get rid of some of the excess moisture. But also I would puree it with a, with a um, stand, immersion blender, yeah, um, yeah. just in case you've got chunks of fruit because the pockets, so this is about the size of the cookie cutter that we're gonna be using. And then you're gonna fold it in half. So really the amount of jam is pretty small. It's like a half teaspoon, a little bit more. And if there's like a big chunk of fruit that flops in there, it could make the, the, the folding together and gluing a little messy. So having a pureed jam makes it a little bit easier. Neither. Okay. So that's um, my. Topic. I also, as someone who I really like prunes, and this smells mm. a lot like it smells more like prunes than like fresh plums, which yes. I really like the idea of with a gingerbread dough. Yes, so, exactly, exactly. The the reason it does smell like prunes is because it's made. So prunes are made from prune plums, mm -hmm. the little oval. In America, a lot of people call them Italian plums or Italian prune plums here, they're called Zvechken or they have other names for them. And, um, and th that's why they're the same plum, basically. Yeah. They have this sort of dark purple oval almond shaped pit. Yeah. And so if, if other people, if people who are watching today are baking these cookies at home, these, like the bibolo we did last year, um, can hang out for like a month, right? They, they not only can, they should hang out for some time. They won't be as yummy freshly baked as they will be once they've rested for a little while. So the deal with um, this dough is similar to the biba de dough in that it's mostly honey based. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> dough, all these old fashioned gingerbreads that have honey as the main sweetener, they, they, they need time for the, the moisture of the honey to really sort of chill out and cause the dough to become sort of chewier and more fragrant and stuff. So they're great for shipping because they're pretty sturdy and they keep well. So you can make a batch and then just, you know, have them in a tin for a while or pack them up and ship them for a while. Shipping times are crazy now um, and they won't go moldy or stale or anything. Also because the fruit in the middle keeps the keeps them sort of moist. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, how about we go ahead and start baking and, yes. oh, I want to tell everybody that, so I've got my chat window and my Q&A window open. And if anyone wants to um, submit a question for Louisa as she is demoing these cookies, I will be keeping an eye on the Q&A. Um, that's the best place to put questions. You can also drop them in the chat, but the chat is sort of more a place to talk amongst yourselves. 
So uh, post your questions and I will ask them to Louisa. All right. So I thought we would, I thought we would do, um, I would make the dough quickly just to show how it gets made. It's really, really easy. Um, I'm gonna, let's see. I'm gonna see if I can do this. So basically you take um, sugar. I measured everything out like a pro and an egg and this Lebkuchengewurz, which there's a recipe for in the back of the book. It's just a, a sort of gingerbready spice mix. I don't know and if you, I'm, I'm gonna yes. interrupt you every now and then, but yes. I yes. made the recipe from your book and I made it three years ago. And I remember we discussed this last year cause I was like, Louisa, is it too old? Like, can I still use it? I'm happy to report it's still kicking. So anyway, yep. um, if you make the rest of this book, just store it in a little glass jar and it's the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah, it's a good gift actually. Okay, so you put those three things together in the mixer and then you beat it until foamy. I hope this isn't too loud, just a couple seconds. And then while that's going, I'm melting the butter and um, I'm actually, this here melts, I just dump, because I, I measure everything by weight rather than, um, especially with these kinds of dough, because they cut so fast with the honey, my honey's really thick. Um, I measured the butter and the honey in the pan together this time, just mm -hmm. because I figured it would just be easier to melt everything together and then dump that into the, into the batter. So I saw that you posted that in your Instagram stories. Um, is, are people still able to go on there and watch you in your highlights? My internet was being super uh -oh. weird last night and I ended up having it in bad and not in the right order. So this will be where okay. people can see how the dough is made. Exactly. And so the butter and the honey are melting together. I've measured out the rye flour and the salt. And the only other thing you have to do is mix together um, water and some baking soda. And I dissolve the baking soda in the water just because the dough is relatively thick and you're dumping everything together. And this is just an added guarantee that the baking soda won't get sort of stuck in a honey clump somewhere and make for bitter cookies. It'll just distribute easier. Um, if someone is not able to use eggs uh, in the dough, which you just used a whole egg there, do you have any suggestions for egg substitutes? Mm. So I confess that I am still really learning on the, I've, I've, I've gone gluten-free mostly, and that already is such a huge learning curve. I'm, I'm not quite there on the vegan substitutes. Um, I have heard that flax and water is a good vegan substitute. Shauna Seaver's book, uh, Real Sweet, she talks about that being a good egg substitute to do that's how I know about it so um you could try that it is just one egg so it's not a lot it's um so it's worth trying for sure but I can't vouch for it I would just say try it out and let me know how it goes um okay so the butter and honey are molten and now we're just gonna dump everything in here there's no you don't really have to worry about over beating or you know making this dough tough because it's rye flour <clears throat> just gonna dump that in there. Oops. And then I'm gonna pour in the butter and honey. I wanted to share, you know, um, do you know Abra Barons? Yes. Yeah. So she sent out to many of us, I don't know if you got this, but she sent out a copy of her new book, Grist, along with uh, a number of wonderful, like Midwest produce yes. dry goods. And I used this rye flour from Meadowlark Community Mill that she sent out. It's from Wisconsin. Anyway, it was gorgeous stuff. So um, if anybody is interested in checking out this company, it's Meadowlark Community Mill. That's fantastic. Um, that's so nice. Yeah. I, so here I sent my husband out to buy the ingredients last night and he couldn't find the rye flour at the one grocery store and this is really suspicious that they didn't have it because it's germany but you know let's give him the benefit of the doubt so he went to like the fancy organic grocer instead and got this incredibly uh ritzy 
bag of rye flour, but it's whole grain rye flour. And I'm pretty sure that the recipe was tested with, you know, more finely milled rye flour. So then of course I went to the store the next day and found the rye flour exactly where it always is. So giving him a side eye, but that's okay. Men, men and their selective vision. Okay, uh, so. Quick question. I'm sorry yeah. to keep interrupting you, but I'm going to keep okay. interrupting you. Um, I missed a question from Amanda wanting to know if you could describe a little more what the foamy texture of the egg and the, um, the spices are supposed to look like. It's really just um, the, the spices should be completely, you know, incorporated. The egg should be beaten and the sugar, like it's just supposed to be well mixed. It doesn't, you saw, I only mixed it for, I don't know, a minute, maybe less. Um, so that's, that's it. Nothing too technical. Um, so the, the dough is ready. This is basically what it looks like. Um, and it's kind of, it's tacky. It's, it, it, it feels warm and sticky, but actually if you touch it and then pull your finger away, there's nothing on the finger. So that's all you really want. Um, and then you just want to scrape it out. I use a bench scraper or a dough scraper, whatever these are called. And I uh, take a piece of plastic or half. Yeah. Well, normally I would take that off the stand mixer, but that's okay. But it comes out relatively easily with the bench scraper like this. Yeah. And then you just put it on the plastic wrap and wrap it up and stick it in the fridge. And um, it can rest anywhere from 12 to 24 hours. It just needs some time for the dough to like hydrate and relax. You know, um, if someone wanted to maybe like freeze half the dough to use later, is there any reason why it can't be, you know, why? why it can't be kept for longer than 24 hours, either in the fridge or frozen? No, there's no reason. I mean, I think um, I wouldn't keep it in the fridge for longer because of the baking soda. I feel like the baking soda would stop, would sort of lose its efficacy after a while. It's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why in my old fashioned gingerbread recipe that rests for two months, like the dough rests for two months, it needs to be leavened with that um, old fashioned leavener potassium carbonate because that the whole point of that leavener is that it can sit at, in, in a cold, dry situation uh -huh. for a couple months and still still have power, rising power. I think the baking soda wouldn't, but but yes, you could you could freeze it and then and then defrost it later. Um, I never have, um, so. I can't, you know, speak from personal experience, but you can absolutely. Okay, so this goes in the fridge. And then <laughs> here it comes out. This is from last night. And this is where you're jumping in, right? You have yours already prepared. Yep. And so somebody wrote me today because they made theirs last night and they were worried right after making it that it was too sticky. And I would just say, if you're worried when you're first making it that it's too, too sticky, don't worry. That's kind of what the point of the resting time is. So now I showed you how it was a little bit tacky. Now this, this one that's rested for 24 hours, it's, it's completely, it's fine. It's like a nice solid block, but it's soft enough that it's gonna be really easy to, to roll out. So I'm gonna turn on my oven. What temperature are you using? Um, 350 Fahrenheit, which is 180 Celsius. And okay. I've got a baking sheet with parchment paper. And then you're gonna need a little bit of flour um, to roll this out. But the one of the many reasons why German Lebkuchen or Austrian Lebkuchen is such a delight to work with at Christmas time is that it's so forgiving and easy to roll out. There's no, you don't have to worry about dough becoming tough or, you know, like with um, more English or, or American short bready um, short pastries that you always have to be worried about it getting too hot or too 
worked or whatever. You don't have to worry about that with this. With no, this. really. I mean, no joke. I when I came home from taking my daughter to school this morning, I was like, oh God, I got to get this dough out of the fridge so it's not too hard to roll out. But no, it stays really nice and soft, even when it's fully chilled. It really is so forgiving. Easy yes. to roll. Super easy. So we only need half to start with. So I'm just going to um, cut it in half, basically, like that. While you're cutting it in half, I have a question. Um, what if someone can't find high fat European butter where they are? Oh, yes, um, that is completely fine. Um, <clears throat> the deal with the butter is that when we were testing these recipes obsessively, we, my, I say we because the person who helped me with this book, Maya is such an integral part of the book. And we decided that we would call for the high fat butter only when we felt it was really necessary because it added a little bit of richness or moisture to, uh, to, um, to one of the baked goods. And that was mostly in the cakes and cookies chapters. Here, it just makes them a little bit more, it gives them a little bit more richness is all, all I can say. You can absolutely make it with American butter. Um, it might be slightly drier. So you might need to compensate by adding a tiny bit more, either a little bit more honey or a little bit more water, but, but we're talking small, small amounts. I would say follow the recipe the way it's written using American butter and then see how, see how the dough is when it's, when it's mixed and, and see if you can correct it, need to correct it. You might not even have to. So here's the dough. I put a very light sprinkle of flour on my work surface just to just to, you know, keep it loose. And then you want to roll out the dough to a third of an inch approximately. Hang on, I need to make myself some space here. Oh wait, you mean wait, hold on. Not a third of an inch. That would be really thick, right? It's oh gosh. Three, I think it's three millimeters. Three millimeters, thank you. <laughs> yes, it's you're right. It's like about an eighth of an inch. And yeah. Do you keep um do you keep a uh, ruler in your kitchen? I do. I, I got this amazing, um, um, what's it called? What's it called in English? When it, measuring when tape. Measuring tape, thank you. That has inches on one side and centimeters on the other. I got it from Netaport today, back when they were still sending little gifts every time you ordered something. That has long ended. But this thing is my most prized possession. I keep it in my cutlery drawer, and my children are obsessed with it. And I'm such, when they get even near it, I'm like, don't, don't touch that. Let's get your fingers off that. <laughs> you are not allowed to play with it. You're not even allowed to look at it. If I lose that thing, my life is over. Um, so anyway. Well, if you ever do lose it, I have a, um, I have a ruler here that apparently I paid 50 cents for at some point. And um, it gets the job done too. Yes, I know. I know. I, I feel like I'm, I'm irrationally attached to the measuring tape. It's just so cute. I just love it. And it reminds me of Maya because Maya, my, my, my incredible helper and tester, she, she's a real stickler for accuracy when it comes to baking. Oh my goodness. And so she was the one who was, who always took over that kind of work. She was always like, we have to measure this, make this totally precise. I was much more willing to just be a bit of a chaos agent. Okay. So this dough is such a delight. I've got a tiny bit of flour on the surface, but it's really just such a small amount. And oh, it's just, it's like, it's silky. Are, if you guys are doing this with me, it feels like, like a nice, cool, I don't know, neoprene suit or something. I love it. You know, and Louisa, I'm realizing, I think that, you, you know, you mentioned the, the rye flour that Max bought as being more like whole grain or more coarse. And I think mm -hmm. this one that I use is too. And so I'm noticing that the dough that you're rolling out um, is a little less prone to cracking than mine, but I'm here to mm -hmm. report that mine worked beautifully, even though it's a little more nubbly. Fantastic. Oh, that's really good to know. That's good to know because some people will want to use whole grain flowers and that's, you know, wonderful. Um, let's see if I can show you what mine looks like, just so you can see. This is with a, 
So it's like it's got that nice brown color. You can see kind of flecks of, of green, but hardly any. Anyway, so this is about as thin as it's gonna get. And then we're gonna take this, I, I have this oval cookie cutter that I got at a flea market, I think, but you could use a round one. It's about three centimeters around. Sorry, three inches, three inches. Three inches. This one, just a regular round cutter. Perfect, perfect, perfect. And then you just want to cut out as many circles as you can. Um, and then, yeah, as, you, go ahead. as you're cutting out the circles, we have someone who's asked, um, since you are gluten free now, have you tested by chance a gluten free version of this recipe yet? I have not. Um, Erin Goyoaga just published um, her most recent gluten-free cookbook, which is called, I think, Canel Vanille Bake Simple. And I am planning on using her <laughs> infinite wisdom to try and um, make my way through some of these Christmas cookies with her suggestions about what doughs would work. She's got a gingerbread recipe in there that, I, that I'm gonna try. So I would say check back with me next Christmas. I hope to have more understanding. I feel like I'm still really at the early stages of understanding gluten-free baking when, without just resorting to a gluten-free mix. Yeah, there, oh, there it is. It's, book for anyone who wants to know the book we're talking about. I am sure- And it's such an amazing book. book. Even, even if you're not uh, avoiding gluten for whatever reason, it's just a beautiful book anyway. She's an incredible um, recipe developer and just has such a, a great eye and a good feel for delicious things. So anyway, I'm a huge fan. Um, all right, so once you've got uh, all, you know, as many cut out as possible, you just roll up the scraps, which look like this. <laughs> and, and do it all over again. And you can't really overwork this dough. Um, it's just, it's very forgiving. So that falls on the ground, we'll just make pretend. We'll do it really <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so maybe what we'll do now, should we go ahead and do the, some filling? Let's go ahead and do we... some filling. And then do you yeah. have some, or do you have some that are already like rested? Cause I know it has to, no, yeah, but we're, I think what we'll do is we're, we're just going to, I'm going to bake a batch that's unrested. Perfect. Will you, as we go through these next steps, will you talk a little bit about, you know, the, the resting that the cookies need to do, et cetera? Yes, I will. Okay. So I'm going to open my films. There we go. Shift my screen down again. You see like how it's kind of like a, like a, puree. Mm -hmm. It's like a butter. It's a plum butter. Could you, you know, somebody was asking in the Q&A if you could use apple butter. Do you think you could? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Great, great, great idea. Do you remember, this is like an eternity ago, Heidi Swanson posted. Do I remember? Do I, I remember? You and I both made it and we're big fans of it. I made that like every year for years. Yes, I made it. I made it not this year, but last year when we went apple picking. I always make it and I always think of you. And the first time I made it, and I think it's Heidi and oh, the olden days of blogging. The I old do. days. God, we were all like in our 20s. Yep. Oh, we were young and youthful. We didn't have children. Oh. Stealing our measuring tapes. Oh God, those little rascals. Yeah, seriously. Okay, so um, do you want to see what I'm doing? You guys can pretty much figure it out, right? Um, so I'm finding that I really need, um, I mean, I am, I am using a little half teaspoon measuring. Yes, system, me too. I am finding that I, um, I need pretty much just like a level half teaspoon. But then again, when it squishes out the edges a little bit, I mean, I'm sure it'll be fine, whatever. It's, it's fine. It's not the end of the world. These are, you know, I like to think of these things as rustic. If the jam comes out the side, it's fine. It was supposed to be like that. 
But yeah, you're right. I am finding also that a half teaspoon is exactly right. But this is one of the funny things about cookbook writing. I mean, you know, it's, I can't tell you. I mean, I, I think I do talk about it a lot. How much, how many times I tested all the recipes in this book? A gajillion times. So careful. So taking so many notes. And then yet still, I'll go through a recipe in the book and be like, ha, huh, how'd that get in there? <laughs> I wonder yeah. what I was thinking. Anyway. Okay, so you've got these dolloped. I think you're doing it a faster way than I am. You're doing it actually the way that your book says to do it, which is to put all the jam on and then do the yeah. egg right around the edge. Whereas I'm standing here being fiddly, like doing, the doing each one, one <laughs> and then the individual jam and then putting it on. Anyway, okay, everyone do what Louise is doing, not what I'm do doing. What I'm, do what I'm doing. Okay, so here's everything all, all dolloped. Yes? Gorgeous. And then... We're gonna take the, the brush, I swear to God, it's clean, and take a little bit of the egg white. And the egg white works as glue, for those of you who didn't know that. Um, the egg white works as a glue, but better than water does. And you wanna just paint the rim, and you can just do one half, you don't have to paint the whole thing. Can you see what I'm doing? Do you need to see what I'm doing there? Ish. And then you fold over the little pocket. Oh my God, they're so cute. What is it about filled things? It's like dumplings or something. I just They have like these, these little bellies. Yes, exactly. So you wanna work, you know, be really delicate because the thing is the dough does start to crack a little yep. bit, okay? But don't worry about that. Don't just be cool. It's fine. Um, and Thank you. so you don't need to, you don't need to squish these shut. The, the, the egg white will mostly work as I, I say, as it comes apart, the egg white should work as a bit of a binder. And then there you go. Can you, does this? Yes. Here are mine. I used, so you can see my dough is a little darker than Louisa's maybe from the more coarse, uh, different rye flour I used. And I did use a round cutter. This one is just cracking a little bit. I have some that are cracking more, but you know what? I'm going to be cool. Yes. Not going to go. panic. Don't fret. Don't fret. Because the, the resting time, the resting time also helps the dough relax a little bit. And these cookies will be just wonderful as soon as they come out. But do use a light touch. Like I said, you don't need to crimp or anything like that. This isn't pie dough. Um, and actually, I think what I'm finding is I wanna, I'm painting the whole circumference. I'm not doing just half. I'm finding that. the same thing. Yeah. And um, it sticks really well. I thought that it might be like a little slippy, but it's not at all. Um, there were a couple that I rolled too thick and um, those are cracking more, so. Oh, interesting. Really, everyone be careful to roll yours really thinly. I think also the whole grain flour might add to the cracking. Mm -hmm. um, because, right. because, you know, the fiber, the fibers or whatever, they'll be less likely to, to hydrate um, as well as the really finely milled flour, which, which I have. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, let's see here. Um, Rosemary is asking, where can you purchase already made Flaumann mousse? Uh, if you're in the States, do a Google search for the word itself in German, and you will find that there are a couple like online German grocery stores that sell it. And I bought mine from, I, I think it was called like German online market or something. It was in California. And uh, the shipping was not horrendous and it got here quickly. So. Yes, and also um, oftentimes, if you live in a bigger city, San Francisco, um, you can find flammes at like specialty grocers. 
they'll have it, um, especially that brand that you have, Molly. That's a, a really famous brand in Germany. And okay. it gets exported everywhere. I mean, to a lot of places in the States. And um, so there are, and then just the other day, a reader of mine or someone on Instagram told me about a, del a German deli in the Bay Area. So there are German grocery stores as well. Um, but it, I think it helps to Google it because I, I didn't know about this place. And a lot, when I mentioned it on Instagram, a ton of people in the Bay Area were like, what? I've never heard of it. So... Um, for someone is asking to see the can of mine. Here you go. Ah, in Seattle, uh, Big John's PFI usually has some apparently. Oh, cool. Big John's. Um, someone is asking if it is possible to use rye flour in the dough. I mean, excuse me, if it's possible to use white flour in the dough, if they don't love the taste of rye flour. Hmm. Well, how shall we say this? The rye flour is typical for gingerbread and for this kind of seasonal cookie. And so if you, I'm, I'm kind of surprised and I wonder, so I think a lot of Americans associate rye flour with the flavor of caraway because rye bread in America, Jewish rye bread is often flavored with caraway. So not to presume, it's possible that you genuinely don't like the taste of rye flour, but in case there's a chance that you think you don't like the taste of rye flour because you associate it with caraway, rye flour itself actually doesn't taste like caraway. Um, and the, the, the rye here, the, 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 the honey and the spices are so strong I would, I, I feel like you're probably going to be fine using rye. I've never made these with white flour. You absolutely could try. The thing is that obviously wheat flour <clears throat> has a completely different relationship to moisture than rye flour does. So I, I can't, it won't, it probably won't be this like nice, firm, easy, pliable dough. I have a feeling it will be stickier and harder to work with, but as always, you can try and let me know and, and see what happens. Um, okay, so we've got a little batch of these cutie pies. They're so cute. Oh my goodness, I love them. I love them so much. I just dumped egg white off my counter. And, um, and now we're going to take the brush. It's sitting in egg white. I'm gonna get a different brush. Um, you know, I, you were saying that there's so much, you know, spicing in these. And I was noticing, um, you know, I keep mentioning the bibolo we made last year, but I think those only use like one teaspoon of the spice mixture, whereas these use two, this uses two tablespoons. Yes. So this will be much more flavorful from the spices, right? Yes. These, because the bibas are filled with almond paste, which has this, I mean, to some people it's a strong flavor, but I find it actually quite, it's delicate and could be easily overwhelmed with, you know, all the heaviness of cinnamon and cloves and all that other stuff. But this here, the fruit, the sort of sour, the sweet sour fruit needs that balance or better, the really spiced dough does really well with the nice sort of fruity pop in the middle. So anyway, once you've got these little pockets, you're supposed to let them sit for a while, um, half an hour, just to sort of chill out, but we're not gonna do that just for the sake of the show. <laughs> um, so when they're ready to go in the oven, you just wanna brush the tops with milk. And this just will give them an, a sort of pretty little sheen. If you skip the milk stuff, I mean, and you could use cream um, and it's such a small amount. I, you know, I, I imagine you could probably use oat milk. Um, this will just, if you skip it, the, the cookies will have a little bit of a dull look to them. It's just, this adds a little prettiness. That's, it's just cosmetic. It doesn't do anything to the, to the cookies besides make them look kind of shiny and cute. I mean, they're already cute. Uh, Louisa, how many did you get out of that, that uh, you know, half batch of dough that you just rolled out? 
Well, I did a half batch, but I only rolled out about two thirds of it because okay. the other third were the scraps that I didn't get to yet. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And I have one, two, three, four, five, 10, I have 14. So I imagine I probably would get to about 25 or 22 if I'd done the whole half. You know, I wonder if the fact that I used whole grain rye flour is making a difference in that too, because I only wound up with 18 total. But um, your cutter was a tiny bit bigger. Oh, I feel like right. my cutter was a tiny bit bigger than mine. I think that you're right. I think you're right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe next time I would use a slightly smaller cutter. I have a whole bunch of like, I have this little tin of round cookie cutters and they all nest inside each other. Yeah. Um, and anyway, I think next time I would choose the, the next smaller one. In fact, maybe I'll go to the closet and grab it. Here. Yes, I'm going to put these in the oven now just to get them started. Okay. And do these, do these take on color as they bake or do they stay pretty much as they are? They stay pretty much as they are. Okay. The dark color of the dough <clears throat> won't really change that much. Hang on. Okay. 18 to 20 minutes. <laughs> just, I have learned I cannot rely on, I'm just gonna put this on. Um, they, they won't really change that much. And, you know, you, I guess that you could say that that would make them prone to burning, but you'll just set a timer. <laughs> you'll be fine. Let's see, oh, where's my ruler? Here it is. Um, Still I was not. actually on Orangette today looking at your uh, fruit and rum balls. Fruit oh, rum balls. It's, uh, it's like a chocolate dipped fruit ball. And yes. yeah, you can put pretty much any, any booze in there. I think my mom always has used brandy. Brandy, that's it. That's it. Yes. But I um, really want to make those. Oh, I love them. They, you yeah. know, they are something, I can't remember if I wrote this on the recipe or not, but they are something that would probably benefit from hanging out for a while too. Yes. Yeah, because all the dried fruit, the longer it has to sort of macerate and, and just develop its flavors, the better it is. Okay. You know, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna run down the hall to the closet where I have all my yes. clothes. Um yes. I'll be right back. Okay. I'm just gonna keep on rolling and cutting. All right, here we go. My and you're back. Tin of cookie cutters. Okay, we're going one smaller this time. Oh, okay, cool. Let's that see works. what happens. Um, as they're baking, I have another couple of questions for you. Yeah. Um, how would you store them for, you know, for a few weeks? Would you put them in Tupperware? Does it, do they need to be at room temp, um, in the fridge, the freezer? What do you do? So I, um, have a collection of tins, like aluminum, you know, metal tins that I use for cookie storage. And I find that they are, they make me slightly less anxious about mold, although I'm really not anxious about mold. So that's like maybe a little misleading, but I feel like a Tupperware, especially the really, you know, the modern ones with like the clip lids that are really, really airtight, those might almost be a little bit too airtight. Mm. And so I like to use, I like to, I mean, they're fine. They're fine. I wouldn't, I wouldn't really worry about it because the whole point of Christmas cookie baking is at the end of the day, you're not really going to have cookies around for more than what a month and they'd be fine then too. But so I'm, I'm a little old school. I have these tins, either they're ones that I've collected at flea markets or um, do you know the company Leckerly? Do you guys know about Leckerly? Um, so. Leckerly was founded by a woman named Sandy who lived in Berlin a while ago and fell in love with Lebkuchen, Elise Lebkuchen, which are the Nuremberg Lebkuchen, the sort of archetypal ones that a lot of people recognize from Nuremberg. Um, and she makes them in New York. They're incredible. And she does, she 
packages them in these beautiful tins. Like the, even if the cookies weren't amazing, which they are, the tins are absolutely worth buying. And if you're looking for a gift and you don't want to make your own I don't know why you wouldn't because there's a great recipe in classic German baking, but you know, um, I, I can actually absolutely recommend Leckerly, Leckerly is L-E-C-K-E-R-L-E-E.com. And so I use her tins a lot for storage. And then I just put them in my pantry. My pantry is cold. And I feel like that's, that's, you know, Maya, who's my baking friend, assistant, compadre, whatever, Maya's really the queen of Christmas baking and she and her husband, they bake like 18 to 20 variety of cookies every Christmas. And they have the tins stacked around their apartment, like in the living room, in the kitchen, everywhere. And so the temperature doesn't really seem to make much of a difference. But I think the most important thing is to keep the cookies separate. So yes. don't store these with any other cookie because of the moisture content it'll just it'll mess up the texture of the whatever other cookie you've got in there just these should be on their own um there are also those uh do you remember did you ever have like as a kid those uh is it like these like danish butter cookies that would come in yes. a tin yes all the, like little frilly muffin cups that they were in that would yes. be fantastic Totally. Those tins. Exactly. Yes, absolutely. Also, I don't know if, if any of our viewers today are like thrift store goers, but um, Goodwill almost always has tins and just bring those things home and scrub them out and use them. Yes, absolutely. And it's, I feel like, you know, it, it's, it's more environmentally conscious. It's you're buying less, you're reusing. I mean, I just, I, I'm a big thrift store fan. I know you guys are too. Um, and yeah. Um, I, so every year my mom and I make a lot of Christmas cookies and, um, and give them to neighbors and to local friends. And anyway, uh, and my dear friend, Matthew, who I always yes. give cookies to, he always gives the tin back to me like in January. <gasps> And I love that. Like yes. I'm the only person who gives the tin back to me, but I find it delightful. Yes, anyway. I, I love that. And I think that's the sign of a friend. Um, I also give my tin back to Maya because Maya always um, <laughs> gives me an amazing selection. I always give it back to her because, you know, yeah, you want to get another box. Totally. Yeah, it's like a little down payment for next year's Christmas present. Yeah. So here, I just wanted to show you guys. This is the last scrap of dough from rolling out and cutting and rolling out and cutting. And I just took the last little scrap and just rolled it out into a not, you know, just nice, easy little piece of dough. It won't look exactly like the other ones, but it's fine. Um, we have a question. Um, so this one is not strictly gingerbread pocket related. But, yes. Um, this question is about any other favorite holiday cookies uh, that you and I have that can be made a week or two ahead of time. Should we take two? Well, yeah, why don't you go first? Because you go first. Oh, okay. Um, so, you know, this is not a cookie, but uh, we, the one thing that I always make every holiday year um, even made it last year when I didn't give cookies for sort of COVID related reasons. I felt like nobody was going to want, want cookies that had, had my hands all over them. But anyway, um, I always make toffee, um, and it's so beautiful and it is, you know, it always feels like slight danger. Uh, mm. you know, it's like all that hot sugar. But um, this year, my mother and I got together and we made four batches of toffee all in one afternoon. And we, we did a mise en place for everyone beforehand. So we had four sheet pans laid out with all the ingredients, you know, times four on, you know, spread out on these sheet pans so that we could easily just like motor through four wow. of toffee. Because, you know, you don't want to scale up candy recipes. No, uh, they can be really finicky. So I'm a big fan of making toffee. It keeps forever in the fridge. It's gorgeous. And um, as long as you have a good thermometer on hand to make sure you get the, the 
the mixture to the right temperature. It's not that complicated. So uh, is, it like a, is it like a score bar? Like, is it with chocolate or is it just so the, one, the ones that we make, the recipe is in uh, my first book, A Homemade Life. And uh, and it is, uh, I think it was originally published in Bon Appetit. It is a, um, a toffee that has, so what makes the actual toffee mixture special, I think, is that it has the tiniest bit of espresso powder, like instant espresso oh. powder, and the tiniest bit of cinnamon, like tiny, like you don't even taste it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's walnuts that you stir in at the end of the cooking time. And then you um, you put dark chocolate and white chocolate on top and you marble them, which is very easy oh, to do with like a so chopstick. And then sprinkle finely chopped walnuts on top. Um, actually, you know what? I have a whole container of them in the fridge. While you start telling about your first cookie, I will get it and show you. Yes, please. That sounds incredible. And I love the idea of a non-dough element, you know, because I feel like that's the thing with cookies is that eventually you start to tire of the same sort of crummy, chewy, etc. But toffee is like a whole nother textural. <gasps> so here, let me show you, for instance. So this is it from oh the side, God. you can see, and this is it from the top. So it's like marbled. Oh my that God. looks incredible. That looks really so good. Good. And yeah, like four, we did four sheet pans of it. And, and I so four sheet pans, how many people does that, how many people is that a gift for? So we, uh, we're giving cookie tins this, I'm giving cookie tins to 10 families this year. My mom is probably giving a similar number and we're doing four different goodies in the tins and toffee oh. is toffee is one fourth of the tin. So that's a good four, balance. Yeah. So four batches of toffee um, are going to stretch to cover like 20 tins plus stuff for us to eat. Anyway, so yeah, this this toffee, I mean, this is like a very small amount of what we made. Uh, but yeah. anyway, it's uh, from A Homemade Life and um, God, I've made it so many times. But definitely if you uh, make toffee, whether you've made it a million times or never before, you need to have everything measured out and ready to go before you begin. Do like, cause you, you just- You don't wanna be scrambling for chopped walnuts. Wow, nope. it's the just go ahead thing. and do your whole mise en place and have it all ready and it's quite easy anyway okay your turn awesome awesome well so i feel like the 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 cookies all they vary so much from year to year but this year i'm making these with you obviously and i'm also going to be making simchdam which are um also a very uh, famous classic German cookie for Christmas. And they are um, made of ground almonds, powdered sugar and egg whites. And it's a real pain in the ass to make them. I'll just be straight with you because okay. you have to make this dough and then you have to cut them out into little stars and then you have to let them dry overnight. I've always wanted to make these though. They are the most beautiful. I think they're, they're the, the most beautiful cookie in your book. I mean, yes, my way of thinking. I agree. They're the most beautiful. And I feel like if you poll Germans on their favorite Christmas cookie, almost everyone says Simpsdown um, because they're just really special. And then, oh, wait, so you let them dry overnight. That's not really the finicky part. The next day after they dry, Oh, no, wait, what am I talking about? No, okay, this is what happens. You make the dough, you cut them out. Then you make meringue, exactly. And you have to put the meringue on each individual star. You guys, it's crazy. It's okay, crazy. Here's how it's spelled. These are the cookies we're talking about. Yes, Simpsdana. Okay. And then you use like a toothpick or I use a cake tester and then you have to like draw the meringue onto, it's a nightmare. And then you let those sit for 24 hours. And then you really only bake them for a few minutes because they've dried out sufficiently. You're just trying to set the meringue really. Um, anyway, oh, and they're flavored with cinnamon and they're wonderful. They're sort of chewy, 
but then also crunchy through the meringue on top. And they're, they're just, they're wonderful. They're a real pain in the neck. I'm gonna be demoing them on Instagram like sometime between now and next week. And I will do it live. So then it's saved as a little IG live. So anybody who wants to see, I'm, I'm gonna do the whole thing from start to finish. Um, oh my gosh, this is a great service for humanity. Yes. Well, because I feel like they're intimidating because they're such a pain in the neck to make, but they really are incredible. And people, it, the gratitude that just flows in when you make them is worth all the effort. So that is another one um, that I'll be making. And then uh, what did I want to try? I have another one I can, I can speak to. Yes. Tell me. Um, so my mom and I always make Russian tea cakes, also known mm. as, uh, you know, Mexican wedding cookies. And um, it's a, a really short dough, so very buttery, uh, it uses pecans. In the past, we used to just use, you know, raw pecans, and now we toast them. And I think that is a big improvement. Yes. So we make those. Um, those are particularly um, fun, or those are particularly amenable to being made with kids. Mm. So, um, cause kids can help roll the dough into balls and then the, the finished cookies get rolled twice in powdered sugar. So, uh, lots of, you know, messy, but friendly work to be done there. So, um, I think I posted that recipe on orange Jet a million yes. years ago. I think yeah. so too. Um, that sounds really familiar. Yeah. And we always, we store them in the freezer. I've never tried keeping them at room temp, but I have to say, I really like eating them straight out of the freezer too. Oh, cause they're cool. Are they like, do they have a different texture when they're frozen? They do, but because it is a pretty crumbly cookie, they stay tender. I mean, they don't ever get super hard. And there's something about the way the powdered sugar like melts on your tongue, even when, when the cookie is really cold, it's very pleasing. Yeah, that sounds really good. Yeah. Um, I'm also going to, this year, I'm going to be making Steuernkonfekt with um, Milk Street, I think next weekend. And that's a fun thing to make. That's also really kid-friendly if anybody, because I feel like this kind of thing and cinch down, not, not kid-friendly because you have to be so precise and annoying. And, um, but but Steuernkonfekt is basically a really, um, loose dough that you make with lots of dried raisins and nuts and kvach, which is this German fresh cheese. And <clears throat> they're like miniature Stein. I mean, they're not really like, they're, they're a facsimile, but their Stein is a real pain in the neck to make at home. I keep saying pain in the neck, but Stein's really hard to master at home. In fact, I don't have a recipe for it in my book because I never ever found a recipe that I was happy with. And actually come to believe that I don't think Truly delicious stein can be made at home, <laughs> but that's a different subject. Anyway, stein confect are nice because they're these little bite-sized, tender little cakes with powdered sugar and um, melted butter on the outside. And um, they're a nice little balance to all the crispy, chewy other stuff if you're doing a little assortment. Are they in the um, Christmas section of the book? They are, they're at the, the, the very end, not the okay. very end, but the almost very end. They're on page. Oh, I see. Here we go. Okay, yeah. It's it's 257. Stolen. Here we go. Right there, everybody. So that's page uh, 257. Um, how much space, you know, going back to today's cookies, how much space do we need to leave on the sheet pan between the cookies? Do they, do they too much in the oven? Aha. Uh -huh. I will show you what they look like. They really don't grow very much at all. I mean, it's tiny bit, but not really. Oh, they're so cute. Um, okay. Oh my God, they're so, oh my God. I didn't think they could get cuter, but they're much cuter. Aren't they, aren't they, I just wanna snuggle them. Anyway, yeah, so no, they don't really grow. Just a tiny bit in height, really. Okay. Um, the cracking on the top, is yep. okay, that will sort of relax as they cool off. Okay. Um, and there's only been a little bit of jam escapage. So I feel like, you know, yeah, so that's what they look like. Oh Thank my you. gosh, those are so charming. Yeah, I love them. <laughs>
I imagine these are particularly delicious with tea, like with a good black tea in the afternoon. Yes, absolutely. Very, very delicious with tea. Essential, I would say, actually. Yes. Um, I don't know what time we're supposed to wrap up, but I can see that it is, it's been an hour. Um, Laura, oh. what, what, what do you think? Well, I think it's a, you know, a good time to wrap up. Mm. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's so nice talking to you. Oh, this is always so fun. Can we do it again? Oh, oh no, we're here. We're seeing keep going. So it it's really oh, up to you guys. We, you know. <laughs> and we are recording this. And so if anybody has to jump off, you won't miss anything. You can watch the rest of it later. Please do it again next year. I was actually thinking you need to make the little meringue star things that I can't say the name of next year. Oh my gosh. Um, I'm up for it. I'm, I'm up <laughs> for it. I don't, I mean, I don't know if they would even, would they even like, would they even lend themselves to being done in this kind of frame? Yes. So here's what my, so the way I'm going to actually do it for my Instagram is I'm going to do them in two batches. I'm going to do, I'm going to make a half batch on my own ahead of time. Okay and then do a batch on camera, so to speak, and then do the switcheroo. And then really the, the most of the work with Sinchiana is cutting out and doing the, the topping with the meringue okay. because you want the meringue topping to be substantial. Like it has to be, it's not just a little glaze. It's like a good layer so that when you bite into the cookie, there's like a nice interplay between the puffy meringue and the chewy cookie underneath. Um, so I think it would be an, a great candidate for next year. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Yeah. It's a date. <laughs> um, well, if, if you don't, uh, everyone, if you don't already have a copy of Louisa's book, Classic German Baking, what are you waiting for? Um, <laughs> anyway, and... Uh, oh, where did Louisa go? Hold Thank on. you for holding it up. Oh, I'm here. Can you, oh. am I? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there we go. I, sorry, I had it. <laughs> Zoom issues, whatever. <laughs> anyway, um, oh my gosh, this was such a pleasure. Thank you. It was really No, fun. thank you. Thank you. It, it's so much fun to bake with you. Definitely next year. Absolutely. And maybe you should make your toffee. Maybe we can do like a, <laughs> you do toffee, I'll make some stand. or the other way around. I'll do toffee, you make some stand. Oh, this is fantastic. Maybe Book Larder just needs to have us do two Zooms next year. Oh, hey, we'll do like, all the Zooms. What are you committing? No, to? please. Every holiday, I think we need to see what's special in German baking. <laughs> uh, Thank you so much, both of you. This was really fun. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And happy holidays, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Lisa. Bye. Bye, everyone.